Hello, I'm Christine Gillum, and I'm here again today to share another lesson with you. Today, what I want to talk about are the strategies that good readers can use when they come to a word they don't know. All readers, no matter what age, will encounter words they don't know when they're reading. Or maybe they know a little bit about the word, but not enough, not enough for them to understand what they're reading. And so today I have two strategies to share with you. You don't need anything for the lesson right now. Just be a good listener. But after the lesson, you're going to need your own book to read because I'm going to ask you to practice at home anytime that you read these two strategies when you come to a word that you don't know. The first strategy is called use the picture. Notice I did not say look at the picture. Looking, in, looking at the picture isn't magical. It's not going to help you understand the words you're reading. Use the picture means use everything you know about the story and the characters to figure out what the word means. Use everything in the picture that you can see and think it through. What is the picture trying to tell you? Now, I'm going to give you an example of that from this book that I'm holding, which is Where the Wild Things Are. And I'm just gonna turn to the first page. The night Max wore his wolf suit and made mischief of one kind or another. So in the very first sentence of this book, there is a word that many good readers would stop and look at. I'll read it again. The night Max wore his wolf suit and made mischief of one kind and another. Well, look at that word, mischief. What does that mean, mischief? Well, as a good reader, I'm going to look at this first picture. Here's Max in his wolf suit. He's got a great big hammer and a huge nail bigger than his hand. And he's hammering it into the wall and making a crack in the wall. Maybe he took this sheet off of someone's bed in the house. Maybe that toy doesn't belong to him. But here, in this picture, with that angry face, do you think Max is doing something his family will like or something that will get him in trouble? Were you thinking he might get in trouble? Well, let's see what's on the next page. Here's Max. He's run down the steps, jumped off. He has a big fork with lots of points on it. And he looks like he's yelling. And he has his claw out. And the poor dog is running away as fast as he can. And if you can see, he looks scared. Looking at that whole picture and thinking, hmm, is this something? Max's family would be happy that he was doing? Or if someone came in and saw this, would he get in trouble? Well, what were you thinking? This word, mischief. The night Max wore his wolf suit and made mischief of one kind or another. What could that mean? Well, based on these pictures, I would say, mischief means trouble. So Max is getting in trouble in this book. Now do you see how I used these pictures to help me figure out the word mischief? Looking at the picture is one thing, but using the picture means figuring it out. So the first strategy is use the picture. My second strategy 
is called Read All Around It. Not just reread it. Not just read all around it and then move on. Read all around it using the other words in the sentence to help you figure out the words you don't know. So I'm going to turn to another page for another example. Okay, it says, and when he came to the place where the wild things are, they roared their terrible roars and gnashed their terrible teeth and rolled their terrible eyes and showed their terrible claws. And as a reader, I had to stop on this word, gnashed. What does that mean? They gnashed their teeth. So I decided to read all around it. So I read what came before. They roared their terrible roars and gnashed their terrible teeth. And what came after? And rolled their terrible eyes and showed their terrible claws. What word keeps popping up in this sentence? You're right, it's the word terrible. So when you gnash your teeth, you're doing something, well, that's terrible. Hmm, kind of made me think, what are some of the things that I do with my teeth? I chew with my teeth when I'm eating, and I smile with my teeth when I'm happy. But what would it mean that's terrible that I gnashed my teeth? So that got me to thinking about when I'm angry or mad, what I might do with my teeth. I wouldn't smile and I wouldn't chew. I would go, <clears throat> and so can you imagine a dog growling? Why don't you growl like a dog? Urgh. What are you doing with your teeth? You're pressing them together. And that's what gnashing your teeth is, pressing them together. Good readers can figure out what things mean just by reading everything in the sentence before and after it, and then thinking about what each part means or looking for things that repeat. So, the two strategies I have taught you today, let's see if you can remember what they are. What was the first one? It had something to do with the pictures. Do I want you to just look at the picture? No. I want you to use the picture. And the second strategy was about reading. Was it rereading? No. It was called read all around it. And that way you can figure out what words mean that you don't know. Now I hope we have time to read this book. It's a wonderful children's classic that's been around for many years and has been enjoyed by children of all ages. Where the Wild Things Are by Maurice Sendak. He's also the illustrator and he's a wonderful writer and illustrator. And I hope this isn't the first time you've heard this book, but I hope you can enjoy it with me again. The night Max wore his wolf suit and made mischief of one kind and another. His mother called him wild thing and Max said, I'll eat you up. So he was sent to bed without eating anything. There's Max in his room. Have you ever been sent to your room for making mischief of one kind or another? That very night in Max's room, a forest grew and grew. And it grew until his ceiling hung with vines and the wall became the world 
all around. And an ocean tumbled by with a private boat for Max. And he sailed off through the night and day. There Max goes on the ocean, sailing away from his room. And in and out of weeks, and almost over a year, to where the wild things are. And when he came to the place where the wild things are, they roared their terrible roars, and they gnashed their terrible teeth, and they rolled their terrible eyes, and they showed their terrible claws. I would really like it if everyone would do that with me, roar their terrible roars, and gnash your terrible teeth, and roll your terrible eyes, and show their terrible claws. Are you ready? I'm gonna read it again, and we're gonna do it together. And when he came to the place where the wild things are, they roared their terrible roars, roar! And they gnashed their terrible teeth, Rawr! And they rolled their terrible eyes. And they showed their terrible claws. <sighs> Till Max said, be still. And tamed them with the magic trick of staring into all their yellow eyes without blinking once. And they were frightened. And they called him the most wild thing of all and made him king of all the wild things. There you see them bowing down. And now, cried Max, let the wild rumpus begin. Wait a minute. What's that word, rumpus, right there? Hmm, what can I do as a reader to help me remember that or learn that word? Can you remind me of the two strategies? The first one was, look at the pictures. And the second one was, read all around it. Well, I'll correct myself. The first one was, use the pictures. And the second one was, read all around it. Well, let's turn the page. Oh, there's nothing to read. I'll have to use the picture. Look, all the animals, all the monsters are jumping and stomping. Their mouths are open, they're making noise. Max looks like he's howling at the moon. Maybe the next page will have a sentence. No sentence. All of the animals are swinging from the trees and they're smiling and looking very happy with themselves. Maybe the next page will have a sentence. No sentence. All of the animals are marching and they're holding their arms and carrying Max on their back. And he has a crown because he's the king. So on the next page, Max says stop. So this, all of this must be a rumpus. So what do you think a rumpus is after using these pictures to figure out what everyone was doing? Would you say it was like a wild party or a crazy recess? I think you're right. A rumpus is a wild party or a crazy recess and they are just having so much fun until... Now stop, Max said and sent the wild things off to bed without any supper. And Max, the king of all the wild things, was lonely. And he wanted to be somewhere where someone loved him best of all. Then, all around, from far away, across the world, he smelled good things to eat. So he gave up being the king of where the wild things are. But the wild things cried, oh, please don't go. We'll eat you up, we love you so. And Max said, no. The wild things 
roared their terrible roars. Do it with me. Roar! And gnashed their terrible teeth. Ugh. And rolled their terrible eyes. And showed their terrible claws. But Max stepped into his private boat and waved goodbye. Where do you think he's going? He sailed back over a year and in and out of weeks and through a day and into the night of his very own room where he found his supper waiting for him. And it was still hot. Now, isn't that a fantastic book? I hope you enjoyed it, but more, I hope you remember the two strategies that you can use when you come across a word and you're not sure about it in your reading. If there are pictures, use the picture. Look at everything that's in the picture to try to figure out what the word means. And if you can, and you can read around it, read all around it. Look for what's in front of it, Look for what's after it. Figure out what's repeated or what the mood of the sentence is, what that whole sentence is trying to say to you. And those will be two things, two strategies that you can use on your own today when you're reading. So find something to read by yourself. And when you come to a word that you don't know, remember, a good reader does not skip that word. A good reader does not ignore that word. A good reader figures out what that word means. And that's your job today, to be a good reader. Well, remember, I'm Christine Gillum, and I was enjoying this book, with sharing this book with you very, very much. And I hope I will see you again next week for another lesson. Bye for now. Kindergarten is great at Kansas City Public Schools. I know this, they have really good teachers. Uh, I know this is a great school. They teach them stuff that I thought my kids would never be able to know at the age of five. Since deciding to send our kiddos to a neighborhood school, we've become a, even more of a part of our community. Now is the time to enroll your future kindergartner for the new school year. Visit enrollkc.org today. City Public Schools. I am the iSPARK STEM coordinator here with our programs. Today we're going to talk about digital citizenship. We think about digital citizenship in the avenue of when things go wrong, but let's preload our students and help them become successful. Let's get started with being internet awesome. Have you ever heard about being a good citizen? We think about being a good citizen, maybe if someone drops something and you help them, or if your neighbor's carrying something and you go assist them, but we also can be a good citizen online. And let's get to know about all the ways that we can be good citizens online. All right, so why do we have important behaviors of online citizenship? Well, it helps our students be safe and responsible when they are online, and it helps them build confidence in their learning and their abilities to navigate and do their work independently. So we're gonna go through five smart steps for making decisions online. This will help you help your student, and it'll help your student be empowered to get their work done, to navigate, and have confidence to know what to do if they're faced with different circumstances while we're doing virtual learning. Tip number one, be internet smart. Be positive, protect your personal space, and be respectful. What do you mean about, about being positive? Well, sometimes things happen 
and we have no control over it. Maybe your internet goes down, maybe different things happen. And just remain positive, it's gonna be okay, and we're gonna move forward. Protecting your personal space. In working from home, we wanna make sure that our space is private, and we protect the things that are around us. We want to not tell or show things that we may deem personal, like our full name or address or our phone number. And we wouldn't wanna give those types of things out to people if we were working online or anything like that. So things that you wouldn't have a talk with with a stranger in person or things that you wouldn't wanna share online. And always being respectful. Being respectful to each other, being respectful to our adults, there are good ways to be internet smart. So let's move on to tip number two. Being internet strong. Get, keeping your name and your passwords private, keeping your location or your phone numbers private. I know we had a lot of pictures of the first day of school and I noticed lots of kids standing outside and I was very careful to notice whether their address was in the background or in the backdrop. So we wanna make sure that we don't share those passwords, those passcodes with our friends. If they're having trouble getting in, that's personal and private to you and you don't wanna share those with others. So make sure that you are respectful and help them, but your personal information, it is just that, it's personal. Tip number three, being alert. Watch out for phishing or scam links. So if you get a pop-up or if you get a link to something, make sure you ask a grown-up if that is something that you're supposed to open if it's not from your teacher. And make sure that if they're asking for information and you get an email or anything like that, you check with a grown-up first. And that will help you stay safe. Next, clicking something that does not have an HTTPS means a no-no. It is not secure. If you see the HTTPS, you know that's probably a safe place that your teacher is sending you. So you're gonna be okay to click those things. Lastly, know the messenger. Know where your information is coming from. You shouldn't get information or emails or inquiries from people that you don't know. Just like you wouldn't talk to a stranger in person, it's gonna be the same thing when you're online. Know the messenger. Know who your information is from. Tip number four, being internet kind. I know in the classroom, we are always kind and considerate. It's gonna be the same thing online. When someone's talking, we're gonna wait for them to finish before it's our turn to talk. If someone wants to share, we're gonna wait for them to finish out their sharing before it's our turn, just the same way as you would in class. Post up for positive is our second one. When you notice someone doing a great job, you can give them a thumbs up on, online. They know that you are engaged in what they're saying and you're giving them some positive energy. Say it or type it, use the chat. That's what that's all about. Using the chat so that you can interact with your peers or interact with your teachers so that they know what you are thinking as you're going through the lesson and your peers can know but make sure that we're keeping that on target for our lesson and we're keeping the atmosphere positive. That will go for a great learning environment where everyone will benefit. And our last tip, being internet brave. Being a reporter, yes, that's right, snitching. If you notice that something is not right with the peer or something that's going on with any of your programs, be sure to tell a grown up. Maybe it's your mom or your teacher. You could always send your teacher a private message and let her know that something is not okay or that you're having trouble with something. Trust your adults. They're there for you. All of our community is sticking together to make our learning environment encouraging, warm, and safe. So make sure you trust your learning environment adults to make sure that you get everything that you need. The grown-ups are partnering together to make this the best learning environment possible, and we want that for you. And the last thing is detach yourself from negativity or things that are not going to be conducive to a positive learning environment. If someone is off task or doing something inappropriate, don't join in, just like you wouldn't in class. If you're getting a message or information that's not appropriate, don't join in. Make sure you tell a grown-up so that they can help you detach from those negative things. Always keep your learning environment safe and invigorating. 
Now, here's a way to play your way to media literacy as an essential path for safety and citizenship. You can follow along and have those times to play, have conversations with your grown-ups at BeInternetAwesome.com. We're going to go there in just a minute. Good luck with having your confidence and having a way that you can learn online and be successful. So when we switch over to Be Internet Awesome, this is the website. You're going to click at the very bottom right here where it says Explore Interland. When we do, you will see the magic of learning to be a good citizen. Welcome to the Innerland. It's a magical place. It's going to give you an opportunity to, to explore the online world. Be Internet Awesome has four different lands. This is your avatar that's going to take you on the journey. The four different lands allow you to play your way to digital citizenship. Let's take a look at the lands. The first land that we're going to go to is Mindful Mountain. It's where we're going to learn and practice sharing with care. Those go over some game and some scenarios that help you know what's okay to share and what's not. The next place that we're going to go to is the Reality River. Don't fall for the fake. It gives you scenarios of realistic things that could happen that can impact your learning environment and this will help you become a stronger learner by not falling for the fake. The next land we're going to go to is Kingdom Kind. It's cool to be kind. Everybody loves it. And that reciprocal behavior will help your learning environment. It will help you be a dynamic learner. It's cool to be kind land. This is where you can grow and be empowered. And our last place is the Tower of Treasure. Keeping your secrets secret. It helps you go through scenarios of what is okay and what is not okay to share. This has been our introduction to Interland. Play your way to digital citizenship. Be sure to tell your teacher that you have graduated so that you can get your driver's license to online. Thank you so much for joining me for Digital Citizenship, Be Internet Awesome with Kansas City Public Schools. Be sure to tweet out all of your experiences with the hashtag KCPS Homeroom. Thank you for joining me. This is Erica Mabian, STEM coordinator for our iSparks program with Kansas City Public Schools. Have a great day learning. I love Southeast because of the culture, the band program, and restorative justice. I love Southeast because of the academic, sports, and students. I love Southeast because of the people, the energy, and the advanced classes. It's not a like. I love Southeast because the students here at Southeast are full of potential and they believe in achieving anything. We are, we are Southeast. 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 We stand. We stand. Shoulder, to shoulder. shoulder to shoulder. Join the Southeast family. Enroll today. Hello, my name is Paul Turner, Social Studies Coordinator for Kansas City Public Schools. And we're going here to talk to you about life after World War II. Times were changing, and basically America was growing in prosperity. But were all Americans prospering? We're going to discuss that in this next lecture. All right, you have this long economic boom from the 1940s to 1960s. What we call Main Street America was growing, so economics were booming during this time frame. U.S. economy was booming from 1940s to 1960s. It was a great time. Basically, you can provide work. Basically, you had time to spend with your kids. Women were working outside of the home. Basically, they entered the workforce at greater numbers during this time frame. So this provided more uh, money to basically spend on the outside world. And you had great uh, leadership. You had basically Truman and his assurances and policies maintaining building preparation for war. And we'll, build, and we'll build businesses for the United States in a considerable time period ahead. 
This time was a great time to be an American. Prosperity built massive government projects, such as the federal highway system. Government spending, aerospace spending, electronics, plastics, research and development industries were blooming during this time period. For the average American worker, Productivity rose, farming impre- uh, out, uh, excuse me, output increased, and led to less people actually farming. Plus, you had these cheap sources of energy coming through this, during this time period. Basically, it led to an expansion of the auto, housing industries, factories were expanding. So basically, if you were basically looking for a job in the city, more likely you could find one. Then you had these political regions started booming and popping. If you can see, the Sun Belt flourished due to cheaper taxes and energy. Places like California, Texas, and Florida became these political powerhouses. As you can see, after this time period, how many presidents come from these regions? The Sun Belt became important as Northeast population moved to the South. So as people were retiring, they started coming down South because guess what? It's warmer in the South, guys. You get basically nine months of basically summer, spring weather. Oh, there we go. All right. So let's talk about what else is going on. You have the growth of what we call suburbs. So let's talk about one of the biggest suburbs that happened during this time period, Levittown, Long Island. Prosperity and availability of the car led to suburbanization. Plus, you had the interstate highway system allow people to travel longer distance. So now, think about this. Let's think about this in Kansas City. Now I can live in Liberty where I can work in Kansas City, right? Prior to 1940, 1950, that driver would have been terrible because you know what? It's probably mostly dirt roads. Now we have two lane highway systems that allow you to go back and forth on a daily basis. So by 1949, William Levitt basically produced 150 houses per week. He was just cranking them out, cranking them out. So we become the suburban nation in the 1950s. So now this all plays a part of the political theater going basically moving forward. We talk about the civil rights movement, we talk about the Cold War. I got a TV, I work in the city, my, when I come home, I'm going to sit down and watch my TV because I, just, I can drive back and forth to work. And guess what I get to see? The nightly news. I get to see all these things getting played out on the nightly news and it actually might get me more politically motivated to vote for the candidate I want. All right? So 11 home, basically in the suburbs, costs about $7,900. Today, that's about $76,000. Levitt offered a deal, half down, and 10 years to pay it off the balance. The FHA offered a 30-year mortgage, 5% down with 2% interest. All right. So now, let's talk about life out in the suburbs. You had a shift in this population. By 1960, you had 30% of Americans living in the suburbs. So we had a huge population shift during this time period. 30% living in the suburbs now, no longer living in the cities. Innovators like Levitt Brothers designed cheap, boring houses in the suburbs. Cheap and boring sells in America. It always has and always will. Suburban living, basically, you had a one-story home, basically 12 foot by 19 foot living room, two bedrooms, tiled bathrooms, you had a garage, a small backyard, and a front lawn. Again, by 1960, a third of American population lived in the suburbs. So what did that do to our cities? We have this term what we call white flight. Basically, you left a lot of the white uh, uh, people who lived in the cities actually shifted to the suburbs. And this left cities for the poor and African Americans. And basically, you saw this tax base shifting to the suburbs. We still deal with this issue today when we talk about funding of schools, when we talk about funding of roads. Our tax base has shifted to the suburbs. The return of the soldiers and the economic prosperity also led to what we call the baby boom. 
So now we have all these, we have this huge population that shifted to the suburbs. They get to see the nightly news. So we going to start seeing basically the, the roots of the civil rights movement. You start seeing basically these veterans returning home as the fighting this war. You start seeing veterans fighting the Korean War. So they started coming home, wanting to use some of their VA, VA benefits. Start seeing, wanting to use basically going to school and basically getting turned away. And now you start seeing this more of no, basically I, I love this country more than basically what this country loves me as. So the roots of the civil rights movement. Basically the 14th Amendment states, no state shall abridge the privileges of citizens of the United States, nor deny any person within the jurisdiction equal protection of the laws. So now as a veteran, if I'm coming back to the United States, I'm not getting the same equal protection of the laws. I'm still treated as a second class citizen. The civil rights protect individual freedoms, ensure the abilities to participate in civil political life. Down south, this wasn't happening. Many times that they had to pass this literacy, uh, this literacy test or pass to basically pay a tax to be able to vote. So now you see these, you start seeing this basically this idea of one man, one vote because society. African Americans. Civil rights were denied by black codes and Jim Crow's in the South, passed by southern, southern states and organizations like the KKK. So what you see now in political life compared to today, you start seeing remnants of this, of this second-class citizenry. Basically, we want to tear down these walls now. 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, established basically public segregation. The idea of the uh, separate but equal facilities. This includes housing. This includes schools. So now we live in this two American society. Blacks were energized by the Populist Party in the 1890s, began voting in higher numbers. Southern states added voter qualifications. Again, the poll tax. Again, the literacy test. Basically denied African Americans the right to vote. States created basically these literacy tests. Basically, black schools are underfunded. Still today, we're still dealing with some of the same issues of underfunding of African American and let's say let's, let's not just say African American, a minority school districts. You start seeing these grandfather clause. Basically, exempt uh, people from literacy tests if their grandfathers voted in 1860. In 1860. Guess who wasn't able to vote? Basically, who was free in American society in 1860? Basically, the Civil War happened in 1861, 1865. So African Americans were not able to participate in basically political society. Early 1900s, 20% of eligible black voters actually voted. They were intimidated. They were discriminated. They had to pay a poll tax. They put on all these parameters, shifting the goalposts for people to vote. By the early 1900s, Jim Crow continued in the South. It was nearly complete segregation. African Americans had their own drinking systems. They had to go pick, if they wanted to go eat out, they had to go pick up their food from the back. They had to sit in the back of the bus. You had these vigilante justice, basically KKK, form lynchings. Basically, this became an American system. White murderers rarely, rarely face punishment. Black leaders like W. E. Du Bois, Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, and the NAACP fought injustices, but few politicians moved into action. 1920s, you saw Marcus Garvey, United Negro Improvement Association, urging blacks to separate themselves from American society, then moving back to Africa. His quote. Our success educationally, industrially, and politically is based upon protection of a nation founded ourselves. And the nation cannot nowhere else be in Africa. Daughter, Daughters of the American Revolution refused to allow American Anderson basically performing the Constitutional Hall of Event. So, Eleanor Roosevelt resigns from the Daughters of the American Revolution. 
she says the African Americans need the right to vote. They need the right to participate in American society. She becomes basically an ally to the American to this new system. A. Philip Randolph, leader of the Brotherhood of Sleep Car Car Porters, he played March on Washington. FDR issued an executive order banning discrimination on the workplace. Let the nation know the meaning of our numbers. We are not pressure group. We are an organization. We are not a mob. We are an advance guard of the mass of moral revolution confined in the Negro. Nor is it confined to civil rights. For our white allies, know that they are not free while we are not. A. Philip Randolph. Even in sports, African Americans had to participate different. Jackie Robinson, he didn't break the color barrier until 1947. Few African Americans cared about civil rights, but this change became their inspiration. I thank you guys for joining me, and we'll talk about that in the next lecture. Thank you. Kindergarten is great at Kansas City Public Schools. I know this, they have really good teachers. Uh, I know this is great school. They teach them stuff that I thought my kids would never be able to know at the age of five. Since deciding to send our kiddos to a neighborhood school, we've become a, even more of a part of our community. Now is the time to enroll your future kindergartner for the new school year. Visit enrollkc.org today. Bonjour les élèves, ça va Monsieur Vinemont ici. Je vais vous expliquer aujourd'hui comment préparer un podcast. Préparation de mon podcast. Je m'appelle Philippe Vinemont. Alors, l'objectif, the student will be able to create a short podcast in French according to their French level. They will be able to record it and publish it. Those are the standard 11C 1.3A. C'est quoi un podcast Podcast is an audio program just like talk radio, but you subscribe to it on your smartphone or computer and listen to it whenever you like. Un podcast, c'est un contenu audio numérique que l'on peut écouter n'importe où, n'importe quand, grâce à la technologie du flux RSS. Voilà la petite explication. Maintenant, nous allons continuer et voir aussi un peu plus. Un podcast Any length, any frequency, any format, any topic. Donc la longueur que vous voulez, la fréquence, tous les jours, daily, tous les mois, monthly, tout le format, simple, very simple, ou compliqué, compliqué, il est long. Et les topics, vous choisissez, any topic you want, peut être avec un podcast, voilà. Alors, écoutons un peu quelques secondes d'un podcast en français que des collègues ont fait et nous allons écouter la salle. Bonjour, simplicité. monsieur. Vous vous appelez comment, s'il vous plaît Je m'appelle monsieur Delpech. Vous pouvez l'épeler, s'il vous plaît Bien sûr. D, E, L, P, E, accent circonflexe, C, H, E. Merci. Et quel est votre prénom, s'il vous plaît Fabien. Merci. Voilà. Donc, on peut continuer. Vous pourrez aller voir vous-même tout le podcast. Vous avez vu que dans ce cas-ci, c'était un interview. Podcast peut être un interview. OK. Maintenant, nous allons faire notre podcast. Et je vais faire le mien. Et voilà. La première question que nous allons répondre, comment t'appelles-tu hmm. En prenant la phrase « Comment t'appelles-tu ?», nous allons écrire la réponse. Et je vais faire ici euh, « Je m'appelle Philippe ». Ok Voilà. Ou alors... Pardon. Voilà. 
Ou alors on pourrait dire peut-être un peu plus compliqué. Salut C'est... Philippe, ok, bienvenue sur mon podcast, vous êtes en level A ou level 2, vous êtes différent, salut c'est Philippe, bienvenue sur mon podcast, ok, alors voilà on a écrit les phrases, nous les avons maintenant, on pourra utiliser ce, cela pour le podcast, deuxième question, quelle est ta nationalité, nationalité, oh ok, je sais, nationalité, je suis belge et américain. Belge et américain. Je vais écrire ma phrase. Voici ma préparation. Ça a du sens. Je suis euh, belge et américain. Je suis belge et américain. Ok, voilà. Nous sommes donc là. Nous avons déjà deux phrases. Si vous pouvez regarder, voilà. On peut voir. Je m'appelle Philippe. Salut, c'est Philippe. Je suis belge et américain. Nous formons for, for, des phrases. Quel âge as-tu L'âge, ok, oh, je sais ça. L'âge as-tu, c'est moi. Quel âge est-ce que j'ai euh, J'ai 58 ans. Voilà. Hein? Voilà. Alors, voilà. On peut dire, j'ai euh, 58 ans. Ou alors, on peut faire plus compliqué. compliqué. Je suis né en... 1962. Ok Je suis né en 1962. Plus compliqué. Parfait, parfait. Nous avons déjà beaucoup de choses maintenant. J'ai 58 ans. Je suis né en 1962. Nous continuons les phrases. Tu as des sœurs, des frères, des enfants. Enfants, oui. Deux garçons. Oui, j'ai deux garçons. Voilà. Oui. J'ai deux garçons. Voilà. Oui. J'ai deux garçons, Léo et Loïc. Vous avez remarqué, je n'ai pas mis les accents, des accents, c'est pas grave pour l'instant, c'est un podcast. Alors, mais j'ai aussi un frère, une sœur. J'ai aussi, j'ai aussi un frère et une sœur. Voilà, encore des phrases, c'est très intéressant. Nous avons maintenant ceci. Oui, j'ai deux garçons, Léo et Loïc. J'ai aussi un frère et une sœur. Je vais juste rectifier ici. Voilà, nous, nous faisons le podcast ensemble. Et je vois déjà maintenant que nous avons pas mal de phrases qui se construisent. Voilà, je m'appelle Philippe. Oh oui, on est peut-être là maintenant, voilà. Je suis belge américain. J'ai 58 ans, je suis né en 1962, j'ai deux garçons, Léo et Loïc, j'ai aussi un frère et une sœur, Patrick et Pascal. Ok, maintenant allons euh, toujours ici, la dernière question, quel est ton animal préféré Dans mon cas, j'aime les chiens, voilà, j'aime les chiens, voilà, on pourrait dire j'aime, ok, j'aime les chiens. Chien. On peut dire, euh, j'adore les chiens. J'adore les chiens. Voilà, j'aime les chiens. J'adore les chiens. Petite phrase facile. Et vous pouvez même dire, le chien, j'adore les chiens, j'adore les bergers allemands, j'adore les colis, etc. Et vous avez toujours ceci qui revient avec notre podcast qui augmente. Nous avons vraiment fait un podcast très facile pour le numéro 1, le level 1. Il reste une question. Quelle est ta nourriture préférée Nourriture préférée, moi, j'aime le tiramisu. C'est italien. Ouh, voilà, moi, voilà, moi, j'aime le euh, tiramisu. Je crois que c'est comme ça, tiramisu. C'est excellent, etc. Nous allons maintenant, voilà, euh, aller dans ce qui est facile. Je vais maintenant vous parler d'autre chose. Mais d'abord... Ok Revoyons euh, le podcast que vous pouvez faire au Level 1. Voilà. Bonjour. On pourrait rajouter bonjour. Ça, ce serait peut-être quelque chose d'excellent. De, peut-être dire bonjour d'abord. Ok Voilà. Bonjour. 
Voilà, ok, nous allons faire un petit peu mieux. Bonjour, je m'appelle Philippe, ou salut, c'est Philippe, bienvenue sur mon podcast. Je suis belge et américain. J'ai 58 ans, je suis né en 1962. J'ai deux garçons, Léo et Loïc, pas ben, 3 ans et 10 ans. J'ai aussi un frère, Patrick, et une sœur, Pascal. Alors, je vais mettre le nom de mon frère et ma sœur. Voilà, nous allons rectifier un peu. J'ai aussi un frère, Patrick, et deux sœurs, pardon, deux sœurs, j'ai deux sœurs. Deux sœurs, Pascal et Patricia. Patricia, voilà, très bien. Donc maintenant, elle est toujours là aussi, parfait. Euh, les deux sœurs, Pascal et Patricia. Et j'aime les chiens, j'adore les chiens. J'aime le tiramisu, c'est excellent. On peut dire c'est excellent, voilà, excellent. Le tiramisu, c'est excellent. Voilà. C'est ex excellent. Voilà. Maintenant, c'était facile. Nous sommes là-bas. Alors, maintenant, nous allons aller à un autre niveau. Si vous avez fait le level 1, c'est fini pour vous. C'est bien. Maintenant, nous allons aller peut-être level 2, level 3. Alors, euh, niveau 2, niveau 3. Alors, quelle est une activité que tu aimes Moi, j'aime les montres. Alors, je vais écrire, ok J'aime acheter des montres et réparer des montres, ok J'aime acheter des montres et euh, les modifier et parfois les réparer, voilà, les réparer. Donc nous allons maintenant parler de moi, de mon hobby, de mon activité. J'aime bien les montres, et voilà, euh, regardez, je ne vais pas vous mentir, j'aime bien de, de porter des montres qui sont assez intéressantes. J'ai apporté quelques montres pour que vous voyez un peu, d'une de petite partie de ma collection, voilà. Par exemple, cette montre-ci que vous allez voir, ressemble très fort à la montre que vous voyez voir. Ce sont des, c'est pas ça peut être copie, mais c'est le genre. Les montres les plus belles du monde, vous avez beaucoup de noms français, FP Journe, okay, Richard Mill. Patek Philippe, voilà Patek Philippe, vous avez la Rolex bien entendu, ok, vous avez bien sûr Audemars Piguet, ok, c'est un nom français, Audemars Piguet, et alors euh, le FP Journe est ici, ça c'est la Patek Philippe qui est très connue, la Rolex, et là c'est la Vacheron Constantin, voilà, bon, je vous montre quelques, quelques articles de, ma, de ma, mes collections, ok, on peut avoir des petites montres ou des grandes montres, et nous allons, voilà, j'ai ici des montres très grandes, qui sont qui font très grosses au, au niveau de la main. Voilà, on peut regarder comme ça. Une autre montre aussi, qui ne sont pas des montres chères. Voilà, une montre très classique, voilà, que j'aime beaucoup. Voilà, nous avons donc des montres, voilà, qui sont très classiques, avec un costume, etc. Et peut-être encore une dernière, qui ressemble à la Rolex. Ce n'est pas une Rolex, mais c'est une de mes préférées, voilà. C'est ce qu'on appelle... La Rolex, voilà, avec l'écran vert que vous pouvez voir ici, je ne sais pas si vous voyez bien, voilà. Et alors, c'est pour vous montrer que j'ai une passion pour les montres, et je répare parfois, etc. Alors, voilà, j'ai écrit une petite chose pour mon podcast maintenant, voilà, j'ai écrit ceci. Les montres de qualité peuvent être très chères, elles peuvent coûter plus cher qu'une voiture. J'aime collectionner les montres, mais je ne peux pas acheter les montres chères. Alors, je collectionne les montres bon marché. J'aime regarder des vidéos qui parlent de montres de qualité et ça me fait rêver. J'ai un petit kit de réparation de montres et je sais changer les piles et modifier les bracelets. Modifier les bracelets. J'essaie de faire de petites réparations, mais c'est difficile. Voilà, j'ai fait donc mon podcast et je vais vous demander, comme travail, de faire votre propre podcast en utilisant le link qui s'appelle Encore. Voilà, vous allez avoir le link, vous allez aller sur Encore. Je vais maintenant utiliser ce lien ici, voilà, pour faire euh, mon podcast et je vais faire un nouvel épisode de euh, mon podcast, voilà. Je vais commencer à, à voilà, 
pouvoir enregistrer, record, et je peux toujours euh, sauver, save épisode, et alors ce sera publié sur mon podcast, voilà. Si je fais une faute, je peux toujours à ce moment alors euh, modifier, continuer. Voilà. Nous allons maintenant faire le podcast et nous aurons fini la leçon. Je vais vous montrer comment moi je vais faire mon podcast. Je vais commencer à cette slide-ci et nous allons parler. Attention, enregistrement, tout le monde se tait, ok Attention, on va faire le micro. Bonjour, je m'appelle Philippe et hey, salut Hey, c'est Philippe, bienvenue sur mon podcast. Vous savez, je suis belge et américain. J'ai 58 ans. C'est-à-dire que je suis né en 1962. Oui, j'ai deux garçons. J'ai un garçon qui s'appelle Léo, il a 23 ans, et un garçon qui s'appelle Loïc, il n'a que 10 ans. J'ai aussi un frère Patrick et deux sœurs, Pascal et Patricia. Mon animal préféré, c'est le chien. J'aime le chien, les chiens. J'adore les chiens. Et voilà, maintenant aussi, ma nourriture préférée, c'est le tiramisu, parce que c'est excellent J'adore le tiramisu aussi. Lorsque l'on parle d'une activité que j'aime ou d'un hobby, d'une expérience, d'une spécialité, euh, j'aime vraiment euh, acheter des montres et les modifier et parfois les réparer. Par exemple, il y a des montres qui m'attirent, des montres très chères comme FP Jaune, Richard Mille, Patek Philippe, Vacheron, Rolex, etc. Mais voilà, euh, lorsqu'on doit parler des montres, ça peut être très cher. Les montres de qualité peuvent être très très chères. Elles peuvent coûter plus cher qu'une voiture, plus cher qu'une Ferrari. J'aime collectionner les montres, mais je ne peux pas acheter les montres chères. Alors, je collectionne des montres jolies, mais bon marché. J'aime regarder des vidéos qui parlent de montres de qualité, et ça me fait rêver. J'ai un petit kit de réparation de montres, et je sais, chez, je sais changer les piles, changer et modifier les bracelets. J'essaie de faire de petites réparations aussi, mais c'est difficile. Voilà, vous savez un peu l'histoire, c'était mon podcast aujourd'hui. J'espère que vous allez aimer. A bientôt, salut The desire to create lives within each of us. From Grammy-winning producers and musicians, to NBA stars, to Navy admirals and Medal of Honor recipients, to internationally renowned artists and beloved local muralists, Paseo graduates have been creating their own success, their own history, their own legacy since 1926.